Once a protein has been purified, the next step is to characterize it. And one of the easiest ways to characterize a protein is to determine its sequence using DNA sequence. And that process will be for another course. But DNA encodes proteins, and so by knowing the DNA sequence, you can deduce the sequence of amino acids. And that allows you to take a sequence and compare it to all of the other proteins that are in the database. We can do this all by computer now and analyze what family it's in, and from that sometimes deduce a function if you don't already know the function of the protein. And that information can suggest further ways to characterize the protein. And once you've purified a protein, what we all want to see is the structure. The, this beautiful x-ray crystallographic structure that shows the alpha helices and the beta sheet. But x-ray crystallography uh, requires that you are able to actually make crystals. And an x-ray beam is shined on this array of proteins that are all in the same orientation in this crystalline structure. And those, that family of proteins, each individually diffracts the x-rays. And because they're all doing it in the same way, you get a pattern from which you can work backwards to deduce where each of the atoms that is scattering x-rays is located. And that analysis gives you a three-dimensional structure. But as we said, that requires that the protein is crystallized. And when you crystallize something, you diminish its movement. And so, in fact, this doesn't work very well. You can't see the atoms if there's a lot of movement. And what that has meant is that because crystallization is an essential step in this process, we've only seen structures for proteins that were easily crystallized. So the early, early structures of proteins were things that you could get a lot of, like hemoglobin and lysozyme, and that were these lovely globular, well-folded proteins. And that tradition of crystallography and seeing proteins and seeing them as these well-folded globular structures set our expectations for what all proteins would be like. And what we know today is that many proteins are not well-structured, or at least they have significant portions of the, of the protein that do not form structures, or do not form the straight, same structure or form structures only in partnership with other proteins. And so there has been a real reluctance to accept intrinsic disorder in proteins because it doesn't comport with our visual image of how proteins are, which is very much determined by x-ray crystallography. The alternative for really getting atomic level structures is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And this involves RF irradiation in a magnetic field. It's pretty much like what you do when you get an MRI, but there are lots of different frequencies and pulse patterns that can give you different kinds of information. The bottom line is that what NMR gives is a family of three-dimensional structures. You get data that looks like the, the graph on the left, and that can be interpreted in terms of the structure and the, the, the number of forms that that structure can take. And so when you look at the structure on the right, you can see that the side chains are not well resolved. They're kind of in multiple places. Even the backbones move around. It, it's not that crisp, beautiful structure that you see with crystallography, but it's also much more realistic. The problem is that NMR is limited by how big the protein is. And so I just want to remind you with this film that proteins are dynamic. Even ones that are those lovely, fixed structures that we see from x-ray crystallography, in point of fact, those proteins too are very dynamic and always in movement. And so we need to incorporate into our thinking about proteins this feature that they move, they are dynamic, they, are, they breathe, and some parts are much more dynamic than others. And so here we see one family of three-dimensional structures on the left, and in fact, different forms of a given protein 
can have different activities or different binding properties based on that movement. And that's particularly true in the loop regions that you see down here on the right, where loop 1 and loop 2 can take many different positions. And those different positions may alter the specific activity. So NMR gives us this family of three-dimensional structures. It's not that crisp, clean, x-ray crystallographic structure. And different forms may actually have different activities, different binding properties. And remember that flexibility is critical to function. So understanding where flexibility occurs and how it appears is really important to our ability to interpret structures in, a, in, a, in an accurate manner. And again, this is limited by the size of the molecule complex. We're actually getting larger and larger structures from, for, from NMR. But you can crystallize a very large complex, for example, like a ribosome or a multi-protein complex. And if it crystallizes well, you can get its structure. If it's large, you cannot do that with NMR. The other way to characterize proteins is to figure out what the function is. Sometimes going in you know, or from a sequence comparison with other proteins, you find, oh, this is in the family of X. And therefore, it's going to have a function that is similar to the other proteins in this family. But proteins can have binding capacity. They can be catalytic proteins. Many of them par form partners, and they also will have inhibitors and activators. And so figuring out how to identify these is very idiosyncratic because it depends on what the target is, what the reaction is, what the other partners are. And high throughput methods where you can use, for example, 96 well plates or 1096 well plates and carry out different reactions in each of those wells and then screen through those spectrophotometrically. There, there are many ways today to use very high throughput so you don't have to do these one test tube at a time to figure out what function a protein carries out. And remember that function is going to be unique to every protein. Fluorescence microscopy has been used for, for many years. Originally, it was built, used to create a, an in-depth three-dimensional picture of what was going on in the cell. And historically, it was dyes that were used to stain different types of molecules, DNA or protein or lipids, so that, that it was possible to say each component was in these, these different places. And for example, that's how it was discovered that DNA was in the nucleus. But fluorescence microscopy has opened new opportunities to look at where specific molecules are in the cell. So fluorescent dyes with some sort of group, usually an antibody, that can react with a specific protein is used to create a fluorescent signal where that target protein lies. And you can use these, these fluorescently labeled antibodies in a variety of experiments. But the image here shows cells that are exposed to two types of antibodies. One is labeled with a red dye and, and reacts with one protein in the cell. The other is labeled with a green fluorescent dye that interacts with another protein in the cell. So these antibodies recognize where those proteins are and light up that region of the cell. And if you want to know where nuclei are, they are the little blue dots labeled with a dye that, that interacts with DNA. So you can see where the DNA is, and you can see where these proteins are. And it just allows developing this three-dimensional picture. You can also get much more detailed cellular information on a single cell that tells you where components are. So fluorescence microscopy is, again, one of the things in the arsenal for characterizing where a protein is and what a protein does. It turns out that, that small molecules frequently are inhibitors or sometimes activators of specific proteins. And their impact on what happens in the cell can be monitored. And that, in turn, can yield information about what the specific uh, 
function of the protein is. Is it a binding protein? Is it a catalytic protein? Where does it show up? And if you have a protein that you're not sure quite what it does, it can be useful to identify whether or not the cell needs that function. So kinesin, for example, it was thought to be involved in the separation of the, the um, chromosomes during cell division. And you can see in the top picture the normal function of kinesin. And there's something called monastrol that binds to kinesin and just blows it apart in terms of its function and literally blows apart the, the, the separation of the chromosomes during cell division. And so some of these compounds can have potential for pharmaceutical applications and monostrol is a, a good example where it impacts kinesin's function and actually can kill the cell and so this is the sort of thing that, that is looked at to see if it would be useful, for example, in cancer treatment. Now, there's one more place to think about what, what is happening with the function of proteins. Remember, we've talked about these interaction networks shown on the right. And recall that these interactions are key to what is happening in the cell. There may be a few proteins that are not interacting with some, something or some, something else, either a protein or other kind of molecule, but they're not many. And a very significant number of these interactions have a regulatory function in the cell. They do something that either activates or inhibits another protein's activity. And so finding where your protein is in this interaction space is also part of characterization. Understanding what other things it interacts with and if it's in a family of proteins that you've identified and you know that, that this other protein has these interactions and then you establish that yours has one of those but not the other, it will tell you something about what it does in the cell. And ultimately cell biology encompasses understanding these pathways in terms of individual protein function. So for reflection, think about why the methods for determining protein structure are important. Why, why do we bother? What are the advantages versus the disadvantages of the different ways that we can determine structure? And finally, how does structure relate to function? That's very important. How does the structure of a protein relate to its function?